Hey everyone, my name is Jared Presswidge, writer-creator of the Scout comic series Howie the Hellhound, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic writer and creator of a fun, amazing series called Howie the Hellhound. We're joined by the ever-talented Jared Prestwich. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Kurt. How are you? Thanks for having me. No, good to have you on, and, and I'm doing all right. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Jared Prestwich. I'm a, a writer from Australia. It's, uh, writing has always been a big part of my life ever since I was a kid. That's led into my work life as well as my creative life. I work as, well, had experience as a journalist for a couple of years, and now I do copywriting, also creative writing as well. So my first comic book is out, Howie the Hellhound, so that's why I'm here today. What is Howie the Hellhound, and what's the uh, logline for it? So Howie the Hellhound, I like to call it a supernatural dramedy. So it follows this hellhound from hell, uh, Howie, who escapes hell and goes up to New York City, gets in contact with the struggling actress named Louise. So... And they meet up. She adopts him. It's it's all great. Uh, it's going really well until Lord Satan, who's uh, Howie's owner, comes looking for him. So that's the ba- that's the basic uh, plot. But I'd say the story is more of just like a it's a love story between an owner and their pet. So a lot of people can relate to that kind of thing. So that's something that I'd like to explore. So the main character, she's not fully formed and she just needs a bit of support and she gets that support in the form of this uh this beast from hell basically so it's a it's a fun book what's the most misunderstood aspect about being a creative writer journalist and copywriter that people who don't follow those industries misunderstand well i think the main misunderstanding is that the work kind of writing is boring or inferior to the actual creative writing but it's just pretty much stretching another part of the muscle of your brain, you know, and your priorities are a little bit different depending on whether you're doing something creative and something a bit more like grunt work, I guess you could say, <laughs> kind of like copywriting. So you've got to find your little uh, pleasures out of it. You know what I mean? So, whereas like for copywriting, I guess your main priority would be how do I make this interesting or informative or make sense? Where if you're doing something creative, like what I've done with this comic book, the priorities are completely different. You know, what does the audience want? What can I give the audience? Stuff like that. Plot beats character beats and stuff so but there's merits to both of course so a lot of people do both as well that's the misconception i think it's it's all fun yeah, well you have to have fun or else why are you doing this job <laughs> besides, right. besides the paycheck <laughs> howie the hellhound beautiful comic five issues that i got to read how many are actually out and of course it's being published by scout comics how many issues and how did you get involved with scout comics how did that conversation come about there are five issues at the moment. We'll see if we can we can get some more. It just depends on feedback from the audience, of course. So there's only one out at the moment. At the time of recording, the fifth issue is up for pre-order, which is a bit of a not ideal situation because we've come across some delays. But luckily, uh, Scout, they're one of the few publishers that actually let you buy physicals um, online so they can ship issues to you instead of just a trade or something like that. For the people that had to wait or that missed out on putting their orders in, they can still buy them online digitally or physically so yeah five issues i feel like i wrapped it up pretty well um but left a few uh, breadcrumbs for later as you know you've read all five issues you you might know what i'm talking about the project started i think i came up with the idea about 2018 or so i think i was reading jason aaron's thor if you're familiar with thory the hellhound i pretty much read up to that and i was like oh how could i make it a bit more real a bit more human and have him actually murder people instead of just talking about it and just murdering, you know, bugs or whatever he does in that series. So it originally started as kind of more of a black comedy where a hellhound would just kill and murder people and a woman who had adopted him would clean it up. But that's not not how it is at the moment. It's a lot more heartfelt now. But that was a little <laughs> that was a little beginning of it. And I thought, oh, I don't think she'd be very likable, this main character, if she was just helping this dog eat people and kill innocent people. Yeah. So in the end, it's it's morphed into more of like a love story kind of thing between a person and their pet. Yeah, but it's been a long time coming. The series itself has been done for about about a year or so. That's that's everything, like lettering and all that stuff. I first got the publishing deal with Scout in 2021. So I've been in bed with them for a long time getting this. Multiple delays have happened. Life has happened. And 
you know, I can get into this, just how to make an indie comic. It takes a while, especially when it's your first one and you don't know what you're doing. But yeah, luckily I had Scout to help with some of the more behind the scenes stuff. They've been good to work with. Sometimes you need mentorship either from a professional side or maybe from a person that's done comics or indie comics for a long time. So the fact that you have a sounding board of sorts to, to answer your questions, because I'm sure there were there were many and often questions that you had in this process. What was it like when you actually got Howie the Hellhound finally created for issue one? What did you learn from that particular process? Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say because it's it was such a long process and I'm so far removed from it now. About a year ago, the whole book was finished and the first issue came out late October. How many months ago is that? Four months ago? What I learned was just the writing craft, I think, is the main one for me. And also the networking that's involved, not just finding the people to join your team, but also, you know, checking in on them. You know, sometimes months after their work's finished, like with our artists, we ran into some copyright issue or potential copyright issues uh, for like some posters in the background and we had to change the name. So just little stuff like that, you have to hit up the artist to change. And yeah, just working collaboratively, I think is something that I learned. Putting the ego aside, taking in outside help, uh, like my editor, Nicole D'Andrea, who Scout supplied, she was a great help uh, with her knowledge. She also has a Scout book as well, Road Trip to Hell. You know, a bit of synergy there, but... Yeah, so just working with others and it was just all a new experience. So I just learned a lot. It's just, I could be here all day just listing everything that I learned through this process that went for over four years. The writing process is, is always interesting because because you've been in so many different creative to copyright to journalism as well. Or I used to do journalism. I came up with the, well, I started writing the series when I was working as a newspaper journalist. So, And I've only started doing copywriting for the last eight months or so. What is something about writing that people who want to become a creative writer need to understand when they first start? Oh, well, they just need to do it. <laughs> That's just the advice. You could go on hundreds of videos on YouTube and or podcasts and they'll tell you the same thing, but it's really true. You know, when you're doing a newspaper, you got to have your paper done, otherwise you get fired. <laughs> so that makes it work. That makes it a bit of a struggle sometimes, but you got to push through it. That kind of taught me to, you know, just push through with the creative side as well. So yeah, if you want to be a writer, you just have to write. Simple as that. You don't start out very good in the beginning. I had to, you know, Howie was completely different when I started it. And, you know, bringing in other people with their own ideas and their own backgrounds and specialties and stuff, it's morphed it into what it is today. So yeah, just if you want to be a writer, just write, <laughs> basically. And then who's the team that's around Howie the Hellhound with this amazing comp? found Carlos Trigo, who's an artist on Reddit, I initially got him to do a cover for a short story that I did before I got started on Howie. And the colorist is Simon Robbins, who's a fellow Australian. He's quite experienced. Uh, and Lucas Gattoni as well is the letterer. He's worked for DC now. He's worked for Scout multiple times, uh, IDW. He's kind of more, our most experienced member. And we've got a couple of other people like Butch Mappa, Mikey Heller, to do some... Uh, alternate covers as well so Mikey Heller he was fun he's a cartoonist that does a lot of stuff on Instagram and he, he used to be a writer on We Bear Bears that cartoon network show it's just all over the world that's another thing you learn when you do comics working out time zones <laughs> between people in Spain and people in Argentina or people in the US and that's the core team there yeah it was a pleasure to work with them over these years it's amazing how the internet has connected everyone, especially for these creative processes. And the fact that you have so many talented individuals working with you on this particular comic series, you know, I, I love seeing that. I love seeing collaboration because it's it just makes things smoother and better. And, you know, you never know if you get an idea from someone that you just didn't think of and it just makes your comic that much better. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So just to, just to touch on the artist relationship or the writer-artist relationship, it was all through email as well. So I never had a Skype call like this with him. I don't think I really still know what he looks like, um, <laughs> even though I've been working for him, with him for four years. So, But yeah, our, our process was really collaborative. So I would write a script and be pretty specific with what I wanted more on the character side as opposed to the layouts. So if he did something you know, different than what I you know, wrote, if it made sense and there weren't any you know, clashes or continuity errors, you know, you go with it because, you know, he has a lot more experience with that. I can't draw to save my life. So, uh, yeah. So then what was a piece of artwork you got from your talented artist that just blew your mind that was way better than what was on the page? Oh, it was the first page, page one. <laughs> it technically wasn't the first page that he did. If you don't know, when you're publishing a, a book, you have to have about five to seven pages done. 
I decided to have a middle portion of the of the issue, which is a bit more action. Seeing the first three pages, that opening sequence where Howie escapes hell and goes to New York, that's when it was really real for me. And then adding the colors on there as well completely transforms it. Not that Carlos is ink for bad or flat or anything like that, but the color, I mean, once that comes in your inbox, like it's just a feeling you can't describe. <laughs> it doesn't get old either. So I had to get, I got that a hundred times more. So it's about a hundred pages in the whole series. But yeah, it never got old. Uh, especially with the time zone differences, it would have been like, boom, 3 a.m. Oh, Paige, I got to wake up and see this. Yeah, absolutely. Always put your notifications on super loud when I was working on this. <laughs> Hopefully he didn't wake up the, the pets or the significant others or anything like that. <laughs> it did. It wasn't a priority. <laughs> character development and character creations are always interesting, especially from a writing standpoint. What was it about the progression of this main character that just made your creative writing better? When I came up with the idea after the, you know, the hellhound eating the people and her cleaning it up bit, um, the actual emotional core of it, um, I found it really easy to just, it just came to me, the, the broad strokes came to me, as in, this is a character, Louise, that has a lot of potential, who is, isn't fulfilling it, and you feel like she's almost there, and she just needs a bit of support, which is the form of a murdering hellhound from hell. Just seeing someone, I see a lot of myself in her as well, which, you know, I wrote the character. That, that makes sense. Yeah, I just saw her potential and saw that there was a way out and I just wanted to work towards that. Because in the beginning of the story, she's very insecure. She's kind of middling uh, in her life, you know, unfulfilling relationships left and right. So there was clear growth there. She's she's not a fully formed human being when we first meet her. And that's just potentially could just go any which way. And I'd like to think it went a good way. It was the draw for me for writing this comic. I know, I know that's called Howie the Hellhound, but it's really a story about this human. It was just a pleasure to write her. She's the best character I've ever written. I know I haven't written much stuff, but she'll always hold a place in my heart, for sure. I've only had one issue out so far, and most of the feedback has been about her, which surprised me and delighted me because the book's called Howie the Hellhound, and, you know, cute dog on the on the front cover kind of brings people in. But it was good. That, that kind of shows me that people actually stayed and they actually paid attention and read through the book. That's the best part, most rewarding part so far writing her and hearing that feedback. No, and that, that's what I loved. I loved her journey, and, and I'm not going to spoil it. I will I will stick to issue one specifically. Actually, it wasn't even the first three pages. It was literally the the first three or four panels of that first page because it was just it was just so powerful. We're always searching for a way in life to become a better person, but sometimes, like you said, we need that extra push or that extra step. And to see it self-actualized on a page just kind of like, reset my viewpoint of a few things I was thinking of in, in life currently. But I think it just was one of those things where you're attached to a character, you want her to do well, and hopefully we can get issue two, three, four, five published as quickly as possible, because I think it's a, a story that needs to be out there in, in the hands of the masses. Mm, yeah, that was, um, yeah, I'm desperate for it to come out as well. <laughs> it was meant, It was meant to come out, I think the issue two was meant to come out in early January, and now we're, was it February 25th? So Scout Comics have a, a two-month break in between issues one and two just to help out pre-orders for comic books, comic book shops uh, because, you know, they need a bit more info to order a second issue and they can't do that if the first one isn't out. But Spider-Man doesn't have that problem. It's been a bigger delay than I would have liked. Just frustrating because I know what's coming. Based on the feedback of issue one, I know that a lot of people would like the remaining ones and I think they'll really enjoy the payoff as well. Social media promotion is always usually a good thing to, to really push. I mean, there's a difference between social media promotion from a Kickstarter standpoint to a, I don't have a Kickstarter, but you should really read this comic. You know, how are you trying to get the word out about, about Howie the Hellhound to the masses with seven seconds of uh, attention span? Yeah, well, uh, it's an ongoing struggle. <laughs> I've just posted about issue five today. I think, I don't know. I just get likes from my friends on Instagram. So I've always tried to lean on my uh, creative team who have been in the comic space longer than I have. Because Scout Comics, they don't really do any promotion other than just posting on Instagram or Twitter. I don't, I don't think they send out press releases to, uh, you know, online outlets to do reviews uh, or podcasts. I don't know whether you get press releases from Scout. So that was you know, interesting to navigate. I had to reach out to you, obviously, and other podcasts and online publications and stuff like that. You know, pull quotes, pull quotes help somewhat. I actually got um, two pull quotes. One of them was from Liam Sharp, 
who's a you know legend from the 90s and now of course and Matt Groom who's a fellow Aussie uh, writer who's worked uh, on Ultraman for Marvel and a few image things sorry Inferno Girl Red for Radiant Black <laughs> so that that helped as well um, and yeah and it's all networking I'm not really well known in the comic space at all it's it seems like uh, about the barrier to, en- to entry is quite quite high if you're not in you're not in you know what I mean um, and the ones that are in they get a, more of the uh, attention online because you know comics is pretty niche for the most part uh, compared to literally every other <laughs> medium so yeah so just leaning on them pretty much that it's been quite exhausting um to be honest to get all these posts out and bothering people and stuff like that but it's all part of the journey it's not like you don't have anything to be you know sad about you have five issues you've created an amazing comic it's definitely enjoyable to read it's colorful and it's going to hit at least the all ages market for sure. I could easily see a market for how the hell huh? because it has everything. It has a, a great heroine. It has a great, you know, cute dog. <laughs> it has great action. I mean, you have great sub characters as well that, that come into and out of the actual series itself from issue one to issue five. Um, the fact that you could expand the series to other avenues is definitely, I could see it. So you know, keep that in your back pocket if you decide to revisit the series as well, because I think it's going to be uh, one of those long-standing series that gets you onto the comic map. Promotion is just about building your community and getting annoying to the point of a cease and desist letter. So you know, you do what you can. <laughs> like my own parents are like, "Oh God, you've been talking about this for like four years," and my girlfriend, yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it's a struggle, but anything anything for the art, you know. We, we can only do so much, but get on other shows, like you said. Keep promoting it and keep doing it, and, and showcase some of your behind the scenes stuff. Because I think writers don't get enough credit for the comics they create. Everyone focuses on the art, but the art of writing is still an amazing aspect to have. And any tips you have for the masses is one more person that can maybe get into the comics here that said, "Yeah, Jared got me onto this path." speak of barrier to entry yeah it's not not much information out there about the actual process of getting published by these indie publishers you know some indie publishers i think like mad cave they have to reach out to you and they pay you scout comics and image you have to do a submission and then you just get royalties basically all over the place you know some publishers are alive one minute and then they go under the next (laughs) it's uh it's hard to navigate for sure so but yeah it was it was overall a pretty positive experience it was just a long one uh, that's what I'll warn a lot of aspiring writers about, uh, especially writers. If you want to do an indie comic, you have to pay for it for the most part, unless you find it, if you have a really good friend that, that knows how to draw and that won't charge you much. Um, yeah, so that's the main barrier to entry, I think. It's just the, the you know, the financial stress um, and the time stress we all need to work. Uh, cost of living is going up. Yeah, I don't know how much I spent on this book. Um, tens of thousands, I think. Yeah, and that's uh, that's the thing. And also... You know, that's just making it and then actually getting it published. You have to get, you know, get the publishing deal. That was the first thing that I thought when I got it. I'm like, oh, damn, now I actually have to make it. Because <laughs> yeah, when you when you uh, submit to Scout, you have to have seven pages together, have the scripts ready, you know, synopsis, um, log line, stuff like that. A, a, a cover, you know, that's a very small part of it at the, uh, as opposed to five issues. So once you have that done and they say yes, you're like, oh, kind of like have to scramble and get it all done, you know, reach out to people and get their schedules in and start paying basically. So that's the process. Other people's uh, journeys are all different, of course, but that's, that was mine anyway. So just pretty much just uh, get the few pages done, send out the submission, get approved um, and then start paying basically <laughs> start paying, not just money, but your time as well. But that's the, the, the struggle of the craft itself. I mean, you, you are going to, if you are really passionate about what you want to do and you want to make an effort of being successful, you, you have to put in the time and the effort and teamwork to make, you know, your comic reality. Hey, glad you did. I, I want to see more issues coming from Scout Comics sooner than later, like we've already talked about. And I think it's just going to be a, a wonderful experience for those that get to read it. So that's a good thing. The continent that you're in obviously you have your own influences and your own avenues for becoming a creative writer but what is the most important quality for a writer in comics today and how does that translate to what you've created i'm not sure that's quite a loaded question um (laughs) 
So I think probably one of, if not the most important trait is just tenacity. You know, we've spoken about that um, just before, actually, um, how hard it is to get in there for a lot of people. And I think that translated to the character as well. Like Louise, she does have quite a lot of tenacity. Through making this comic book, uh, COVID happened. Well, actually, let's go back. I went to, uh, I was, I, I graduated uni, got my first graduate job, moved two states uh, down. So it's a 20 hour drive. Um, to a state I've never been to, uh, where I don't know anyone, deal with, you know, working your first full-time job, COVID hitting, <laughs> having all that weird time uh, where, like, in the state that I was living, Victoria, it got hit by COVID hard, where the rest of the country didn't really, where, you know, toilet paper was uh, not available and, you know, all that stuff. Going through that, being promoted really quickly, to being, being given your own newspaper that you have to work on by yourself. Um, and then also trying to spend some time writing a comic book um, and then the financial things around that. So I think, yeah, in comics, I think especially just the nature of the beast and the business, I think you need to have tenacity and, and you know, just a, a blind drive in some, in some cases just to get it done um, and believe in what you've created. Yeah, I'd say tenacity would probably be one of, if not the most uh, important you know, thing you should have, at least for me, that's just me though. I'm sure other people will say a lot of different things, but yeah, tenacity for sure. If you could be a fictional character, who would you be? Oh man. I don't know. Like, I mean, I've always had this long, you know, dream of being uh, a character in Dragon Ball Z, <laughs> just being, being able to fly. But you know, the, the stipulation would be there'd be no bad guys. So you just like, just kind of fly around and teleport around and stuff like that. Yeah, I think ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to be Goku, I think. <laughs> uh, well, you can train to get the body of Goku. As long as you're not a Yamcha, then you're fine. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's what's stopping me. <laughs> Just uh, the fear of becoming Yamcha. <laughs> uh, someone actually said I should become Krillin for Halloween one time. I'm like, really? Like, I know I'm going bald, but, and I know I'm short, but, you know. <laughs> uh, hey, he's my favorite character, so... You know, take it well. Well, if I said it to you, it would be a compliment. <laughs> I, I'll appreciate it. I do. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, um, not to get too depressing, but you know how, um, how you have this conversation with your parents when you're young and then you bring it up later and they don't remember it? <laughs> and it's just like an offhanded thing that they say to you, but then you remember it later. That was a big one for me. That taught me a lot about language, you know, when you hit that, when you hit that teenager um, phase where everything, you know, kind of, you know, hurts your feelings and stuff like that. You get a bit angsty. Um, yeah, I'll say that. That's kind of a, a, a bit of a different, you know, a bit of a U-turn from talking about drunk badminton, but I'll go, I'll go with that. The drunk badminton's more of an icebreaker, actually. So <laughs> what was the hardest scene for you to write in this comic series? Well, there's a, there's a character in the book, the boyfriend character. Uh, Louise's boyfriend he's quite prevalent in the first issue or two um, and I had it going a different direction I don't want to go into too much detail because that would spoil what actually happens in the book but he had a bit more of a prevalent role he's not a good boyfriend I'll just say that he originally wrote him to be a really bad boyfriend so I was going back and forth on how far I wanted to go but I eventually I think went to a better way a, away from the typical you know abusive boyfriend kind of thing so that that was something that I went back and forth on, for the most part, my first drafts of Howie, they're pretty much the same as what they ended up being. And I wrote them before I got on board with Scout and, and got the editor to look through them and stuff. But that was the main one, just the boyfriend, uh, Louise and her boyfriend relationship. It, it was a lot different. The original ending actually, of issue one actually had him getting killed um, at Eden. <laughs> and that's not what happens. Spoilers, that doesn't happen. That was the big one that went back and forth, I think. I did have a little bit of trouble in the end, like the climax. I think a lot of writers will tell you that, that, you know, it's just hard to wrap up stuff. So those are, those are the two hard ones. As, you know, emotionally hard to write, I didn't really have any I have a problem with writing any of it. Um, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know whether it's just because I created it. I'm just, and that kind of just makes me detached from it in a way. That's just how I am, I think. I think if I have more involvement in it, the more, more detached I am and it's more like work. Um, not that I didn't enjoy writing it, but yeah. I didn't have, you know, I didn't have any moments where I'm like crying, like writing, writing Louise's big monologue or whatever. But yeah, it was just fun to write. Too hard. It's just going back and forth with the boyfriend, you know, trying to figure out what I want to do with him. Uh, and the climax, of course, 
you know, nameology is, is fascinating to me because it kind of gives you a glimpse into the creative process. Why was naming Louise important? And were there any other names that you kind of went back and forth on before finalizing them? Mm. No, I don't know. I, I didn't put much thought into it. I don't even remember uh, figuring out that was her name, to be honest. There's not really any any backstories for any of the names in Howie, I don't think, except for, like, there's a character called Flamehead, and he's called Flamehead because he has a flame on his head. Uh, other than that, uh, and Howie, I guess, you know, I had to, I had, I needed alliteration, like, with, How, with Hellhound. It's hard to find a good H name, like, because I can't really, like, Hector the Hellhound doesn't sound very good. With my other writing, I do have this thing where I like to name my characters after players from rugby. Uh, like NRL, uh, it's called Rugby League in Australia. Uh, it's a sport that I'm a fan of. So, because naming, I, I always find it hard to settle on a name. So I just kind of like look through and just, you know, there's hundreds of players. So if you're an Australian fan and you and you read any of my stuff later, there'll probably be a few, <laughs> a few like uh, deep cut names. But yeah, I don't usually put put too much um, stock into names really. Um, uh, there's another character called Twist who's a demon, and I just thought it sounded kind of cool, like. Twist and Flamehead, they're like kind of a duo. I don't really put too much stock in their nameology. <laughs> so then who's your top three rugby players that you like? Top three rugby league players. I'm going to name these people and you're not going to know who they are. Valentine Holmes. So pop pop him up. Yeah, Hamaso Tabuai Fido. And uh, me when I was 12 and I used to play when I was in it, playing under 12s. Awesome. So uh, what stopped your rugby league career? talent <laughs> well lack of talent i'll just leave it at that what's your favorite underappreciated novel or comic underappreciated comic well there is this one comic um called gunning for hits it was written by jeff rugby and moritat so jeff is a producer like an actual rock producer and this is about rock and roll so he worked with bowie for an album so he had a lot a lot of cool stories like in the in the liners at the end of the, each issue uh, just talking about his experiences and how that kind of bled into this book so it's basically about a rock and roll manager that's also a hitman so to get his best people he threatens them that to join his label it's actually a really good series like I, it's only one trade unfortunately it didn't go any further i only i only heard about the book because i was doing some freelance writing for a comics book website well um and they and they had review copies and I loved it. Like I thought it was great. So just um, look out for Gunning for Hits if you see it anywhere. And also a novel. I just finished a novel. I don't think it's underrated. I think it's meant to be good. But uh, Northwoods, it's about this cabin in Massachusetts. And it follows the different people that lived there from the 1800s, or 1600s or something to now. A lot of the chapters are written in different ways. Like uh, some of them are diaries, some of them are letters, and then others are just like, you know, normal prose. So those are, those are two of my uh, recommendations for you. Interesting. I'm always looking for new stuff to, to read. It's uh, it's always great to see what people are enjoying these days. So you can only interview so many people without without getting some recommendations. Yeah, I tried to do something a little bit different. You know, um, I'm sure you've read Watchmen. <laughs> I'm not gonna, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not going to recommend uh, stuff like that. But yeah, Gunning for Hits, I actually recommend it. Um, if especially if you're a fan of like 70s, 60s kind of rock culture which i i am so yeah give it a go i interviewed a uh canadian rock guitar photographer and she all she photographs is rock guitars she's uh lisa s johnson she does uh, macro uh guitar photography if you're ever interested in guitars um and their history look at 108 axes that rock the closest i've ever gotten to the rock world was i met a former tour manager of the rolling stones he was the tour manager. Um, I can't remember what the gig was, but it was one where someone got killed in the audience in this late sixties. They filmed it in uh, "Give Me Shelter," that documentary. So he was the first guy that you hear in the in the movie. <laughs> Just this guy, this old guy that I met in Brisbane, which is where I live in Australia. He's passed away now, but he was um, the dad of one of my good friends in uni, and we were going to interview him for this podcast we had back in the day because he was in "Give Me Shelter," like a Criterion Collection movie. And he also managed the Grateful Dead as well. So that was my that's my closest brush with the old <laughs> the old days of way, way before I was born. What is your creative kryptonite? Kind of goes against what I said earlier. You know, you gotta write uh, to be a writer, I find myself. 
especially lately while Howie was gestating and coming out, you're writing. So like moving on because I was, I've kind of been in this uh, funk a little bit, like waiting for Howie to come out. Cause I feel like having a book out would have, would leave me open to, you know, some more opportunities maybe to get some artists of renown or something like that. So I've actually, um, had quite a bit of a sabbatical from writing to be honest so that's my kryptonite and sometimes it's just hard like when you when you sit down all day at a computer and you write going home and then getting on the computer again like it's just (laughs) sometimes you don't want to do it so that's my kryptonite yeah sitting down i I think that's my main kryptonite i'm glad i have a stand-up desk at work but i don't at home actually that's that's an actual like because kryptonite is an object i'll just say desk chair is my kryptonite (laughs) As I've gotten older, sitting down is just a, just a chore. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? That's a tough question because I, I, I take a lot of inspiration from a lot of different places. So uh, I wouldn't be here today without just being a bit of a, a bit of a snoop and just a bit of a people watcher, I think, and just taking in what people say, their conversations. And it's kind of shaped my view of the world, obviously, and you know, probably the way that I write my dialogue as well. I'd like to think that I write pretty realistic, you know, dialogue, not too stilted and free flowing, I think. But in terms of just inspirations for writing, Brian K. Vaughan, I don't think I would be here um, if I hadn't read (laughs) Why the Last Man when I did. Alan Moore as well. You know, Ernest Hemingway is a big influence for me as well. So those those are three big ones. Um, I could go, I could go on all day about all writers that I like, you know, Filmmaking as well, Martin Scorsese, Stanley Kubrick is probably my favorite director of all time. Yeah, the list goes on and on, but those are a few for you. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful writer in as a journalist, as a creative writer, and of course, as a copywriter as well. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> I still feel like I'm at the beginning of my working journey. I was a little bit of a mature age student, I think. I think I went to university when I was 23. So I didn't actually get my first full-time job until I was about 25, where I worked at a newspaper down in uh, Victoria, which is a a state in Australia, for those that don't know. So that was a journey for about two years there. And then COVID hit. And then I moved back up to Brisbane, where all my family was, just because I'd had enough, basically. And that pretty much started me from square one. So I had to work myself up again another two years while I was working on Howie the Hellhound. So I had a job that was a little less taxing uh, and had a lot less money, which comes with it. And I've only recently gotten this copywriter job. I work at a university, so so it's not really like freelance or anything like that. And I've only been there for eight months. So no, I don't consider myself successful. I, con- I consider myself at the bottom of the rung for sure. But it's okay. Uh, I don't mind. Still got a few years left in me. I'm 29, so... I think you have a few more years the left in you then. Depends on who you ask. <laughs> Depends on who you who you hang out with. Between the two jobs that I've had, the current job that I'm at and the one before, um, it's a completely 180 shift from being old to being young. So as long as you hang out with people older than you, you'll always feel young. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Mm, I don't know. Like I haven't really come, ac- come across too many failures, I don't think. We'll see if Howie the Hellhound's a failure. I don't consider it a failure for me personally, but it probably will be monetarily. But yeah, I don't know. You just have to keep going, I guess. Like, it, you know, when the bad times hit you, it's like when you break your arm, uh, it hurts. And there's really no way to really fix it. You just kind of have to work through it <laughs> until it doesn't hurt anymore. So if you fail, in the very few times I have, you know, come across a big failure, I've been quite lucky in that regard. You know, you just kind of move on. You learn from it and you move on, basically. Until you stop failing, I guess. The younger generation is looking at your work, of course, Howie the Hellhound, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or a creative person in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you've inspired them down that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Mm, um, not make content that's four seconds long. To pass on to the next generation, I think you just have to look back at the generations older than you and learn from them you know, learn from their mistakes, take what's good for the most part. I'm a bit of an older soul, I guess. So I always think that stuff back in the day is better. I think to pass stuff on, you know, you are pretty much just passing on the wins and losses that you had. I think uh, parents, you know, as a, as a child, uh, as someone's child, I always, you know, thought of my role. One of my priorities was 
to you know learn what they did wrong and what they did right and try to become a better version of them basically if that makes sense so yeah so that's what i would say to inspire the next generation i think you have to look back in some way if your life was a comic book what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be oh man i know i know what i would want the soundtrack to be <laughs> it would be a lot of like uh, a lot of beatles uh and rolling stones and stuff from like cream and whatnot but i don't think that would actually happen i think it would just be slow fi <laughs> unfortunately i think i would be really unhappy <laughs> if my life was a comic book or a movie yeah i don't know it would be really boring i like i'm not gonna sugarcoat it or anything i think my life would be very uh, as a comic book would be super boring <laughs> so you know i try i try to make my comic books a bit more exciting than my life hopefully i've done that that's a good way to turn that answer around i like it well, Jared, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing Howie the Hellhound comic series? And how can we get more issues? To answer your last question first, you can get more issues by buying the current ones. So issue one is currently out. I'd recommend going on scoutcomics.com. How the Hellhound Scout Comics.com. It'll have all the all the web store exclusives, all the physical copies, all the digital copies there. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, J Prestwich. Uh, it's kind of hard to spell, so just look below me. But yeah, I mostly just post promotion about the work. You know, I would like to post some stuff, uh, behind the scenes stuff, maybe some old sketches that uh, Carlos and the team came up with. Yeah, so that's how you can find me. But uh, I think the priority is. You know, just go on to scoutcomics.com, order the books, because that's the best way you can support this industry is by buying indie books. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, 1200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Website's going through a revamp. Go to our YouTube channel because that's always updated because I am only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. Search Two Geeks Talking on any podcast platform you get your podcast at or to geekstalking.podbean.com as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on to geeks talking